what happened when our lives were separated by law from white people? You are watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. Well, I'm talking with Liv right today, and as you know, if you've been watching this program, Profunda TV, you'll know that I like to surround myself with deep thinkers, with philosophers, with people who are always examining what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live a fully expressed life? This is Liv Wright. Hi, Liv. Hi. So I know this is a, this is a challenging time because we are in our houses. Yeah. You are, like others, you are uh, affected by the pandemic as well. Um, I want to know what you're thinking and what's on your mind. You said you were examining something that you wanted to share with partners. What is yeah, it? Yeah, totally, totally. So um, I will start from the beginning because it's a good place to us, for me to start and say that a few years ago, I went to a seminar here in Manhattan. Seminar was called Beyond the cloning. And in that uh, seminar, the scientists there were um, previewing the future. And some of the, what they invited us to do was to look at the uh, tinkering around with genes that had begun to go on then, and I think uh, is going on now changing eye color, gene for eye color, changing gene for height, and so on. So the presenters ended up the seminar talking about human beings going to other planets. And suppose they went to other planets and were tinkering around with human genes. So we have a planet with blue-eyed people, a planet with only tall people, etc. But what struck me was the question the uh, presenters ended with. And they ended with the question of whether we could, we human beings, could create, end up creating a subspecies in our homo sapien configuration, whether our going to other planets would create a, a non-mating with people from other planets, would create all blue-eyed so-and-sos from a certain planet, and all brown-eyed so-and-sos from another planet. So that uh, uh, bug or that seed rung in a very strong way uh, in the last couple weeks. I grew up during the time of segregation and began to think in terms of all of the people who want right away change uh, in our institutions like uh, uh, NASCAR yesterday announced they wouldn't use Confederate flag anymore. Some people want to tear down Confederate monuments and so on. So I began to think that if it's true that we brown-eyed people, let's call them uh, black people, uh, had, grew, had a such a different experience from the people who grew up as white in that time of segregation. So I've been thinking a lot about the development of different ways of being. When I watched the uh, George Floyd uh, memorial service in uh, what, Houston? Yes. One, and I watched it in that C-SPAN way. No commentary, no other voices, only the service. And 
one of my takeaways then was the norms associated with that kind of service developed during segregation. I remember one of the norms that the congregants and I responded to was Al Sharpton, when he was nearing the end of his eulogy, Al Sharpton said something like, well, I'm in the preacher's house now, so uh, I think the preacher's last name was Wright or White or something like that. So Reverend Wright, I'm going to go ahead and do some preaching. And we who grew up in that kind of black church knew exactly what he meant. He meant it was going to get more expressive, more sermonic, more singing. And when he spoke in that way, the organist knew to use the organ in that um, uh, expressive way to underscore and enhance and embellish whatever the preacher was saying. That is something we developed in segregation. We have norms about that that I do not think that do not indeed exist in other Christian environments. You with me? Yes. So, yeah, so I have been working for the last, uh, every time I can, the last two weeks to ask myself the question, what happened when our lives were separated by law from white people? One of the stories I like to, I have already told in uh, one of my blog essays is about the super, super light-skinned person who was a friend of my mother's. And in the 1950s, it was a no-no for black women to be waiting tables. And I use the example uh, of a, a sandwich uh, chain we had in New York called Chock Full of Nuts. Remember it? Yeah. yeah. So my mom and I went into a Chock Full of Nuts because we were downtown shopping. And the woman behind the counter where we sat was my mother's friend. And because she, uh, my mother knew and the uh, waitress knew about obviously how segregated uh, things were in employment in New York. So the woman behind the counter knew not to speak to us and we knew not to speak to her. So we sat at the table, not at a counter, not acknowledging each other, because we knew that the way America was then, there was absolutely no reason for a white waitress to be, to be friends with a black mother and her daughter. We knew that. Now, my mother had to explain to me after we left the uh, Chuckful Nuts that the people who at Chuckful Nuts hired her may not have known she was what we called at the time a Negro. So uh, let's not make trouble for her is, was the stand my mom took. Well, so, let, me, let me just interrupt you and say, you just said the phrase that, that I think is key to this whole question of what is it to be Black in America? You said your mother wanted to tell you, let's not make trouble. So essentially, I think that underneath all experiences of Blackness is this concern of not making trouble. Correct. 
as you as you move through society, as you go through school, as you go into work, you have an underpinning of let's not make trouble. Now I'm not talking about um, advocacy or the lack of advocacy or political action. That's a whole other conversation. I'm just talking about the underpinning of the human being has embedded in it, you better not step out of line, you better be good, you must not make trouble, and especially not make trouble for your people. Correct. Am I, am I right in that? That that's yeah, totally. That's and and, and uh, as an act of labor, the mm -hmm. assumption was that somebody in the family would tell the kids the deal. So mm -hmm. for example, one of my dear friends from childhood told me a story a while ago about taking, I think she and I were talking about that movie, Green Book. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So her grandparents took her down south for a trip. And my friend had to go, was from New York and wanted to go to the bathroom as soon as she could. So they got to a gas station, opened the door. My friend ran out to the bathroom without seeing the sign, colored women, white women. She didn't see that. The gas station, the white gas station attendant went to her, my friend's grandmother and said to the grandmother, please tell her child to use the right bathroom. Don't use that bathroom. And um, the expectation is that the way segregation worked, some elder in the family would pull a kid aside and say whatever was the rule. In my mom's case, it was, she would used to pinch me and I would know to be good. And that, what, that pinch in that chock full of nuts is when my mother wanted me to know, do not do anything to indicate that you know that person. P.S. That person was my Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about a, uh, um, a way of being that uh, rewards hypocrisy in a certain way and, and, and makes it very hard for us as Black people to live with integrity. Makes it very hard because we see the rewards available to our kinfolk and to us if we would just bend the truth. Don't say you live so-and-so way. Don't say you go to such and such school. And we're looking at that now, I have said in that same blog, with uh, uh, people who don't have papers on uh, the undocumented are in that same world of uh, having documents that they paid for uh, that will say something, say whatever you need to say on that document to work or drive a car or uh, live someplace as if what was on the document was so. All right, well, I want to, you know, I want to be conscious of how the lament, which I think we're engaged, in my view, we are get, engaging in a lament, how that is heard by the person who did not grow up in, during segregation times, who does not feel responsible for the slavery or the enslavement of others. And it is so fascinating that even in the marching now, that there have been so many young white people who have engaged in this march. So I wonder, how is this being heard now? Because I used to feel, oh, no one's going to understand this. They're going to hear this. 
as constant complaining and they're going to hear it as, hey, why don't you get over it? You got it. You had a black president. Why don't you just get over this? So is there something different now in the listening, do you think, that makes it okay to communicate the history, the pain, the problems that really have occurred for black people? Not sure, because all of this, I, I would say, as a, a student of that ontological way we know about, mm -hmm. all of this lives in the human body. So I, I will take on its face that the marchers you are talking about saw a human being uh, with a knee on his chest. And as human beings, that was troubling. They don't need to know all of the, um, uh, the um, legalistic stuff that I lived under, frankly, was administrative. Mm -hmm. Now, at night, vigilantes could come to your house to um, uh, harass you. That's in our bodies, that there is a, a group of trucks outside my house, cars outside my house, creates fear. Um, the sight of Mr. Uh, Floyd being, um, having that knee on his chest. On his neck. On his neck was a visceral something. So I'm, I, I accept that as cause for action. But I'm not, I'm not sure that the young white people can process all of the administrative stuff that we black people uh, took into our lives and into our homes. Like, yes. you where to yeah, say I'm, yes? interrupting you. I'm interrupting you because you started your journey in this conversation about going to a lecture beyond cloning. Correct. You were struck by the discussion leading to separate planets with different racial components on each planet. Yeah, and does, yeah. Does that and, suggest that you think that there really is still a need, there's still a deep desire to keep the races separate? Is that what you're saying? I, I do say that, but I want to acknowledge that the uh, game plan to keep us separate, that succeeded in creating differences. For example, one of my neighbors yesterday uh, told me a story about uh, trying to buy shoelaces some, in some fancy store. And a white friend of hers thought, nobody buys shoelaces, take them. And the black friend said, I can't just take because there will be very different consequences for me. Mm. My takeaway is that that body part called amygdala is different. It's wired different. For white, uh, when black people see cop car, our amygdala signals danger. When yes. a white person sees a cop car, that does not happen. They, they are reassured that the cops will, uh, will protect and what, uh, guide or whatever that other word, guard um, is the other one. So we already, in that time of segregation, did some rewiring that may not be as uh, uh, profound as cloning, but it has hereditary uh, impact in the same way cloning does. That mom wants to make sure that I have the same fears she has for my protection. 
talking about your experiences as a young person and how it's embedded in the system as you grew up. But Liv, you know, when, even though you and I are friends, I have to say that my view of all of this is this stuff has got to go away. You know, it's, it's time to be in the 21st century. I mean, our big concern is how we're going to work with the robots when they start showing up. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be a worthwhile endeavor I mean, to really dwell on the differences. I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge the differences, to make sure the playing field gets leveled so that we are all on the same playing field. That would be important. But to get caught up in the racial and skin differences now seems to me to be a per perhaps a mistake. Now, we may not agree on this, so you can tell me what you think. Yeah, what I think is that because this um, narrative is so much in our bodies, I'm not sure we can disappear it as easily as mm. we think. So I say that because in uh, one of Toni Morrison's books, I forget which one, but it's one of my favorite passages from Toni Morris. It's about trying to, metaphorically at least, climb up out of your dark skin color in the same way that a person climbs a ladder and looks out over a fence and sees the next uh, property or the next house. I don't 100% understand it, but that thing of uh, dark color, light color, is mm -hmm. inside bodies. And for to have dark brown skin is a big deal today. Mm -hmm. And that is why changing what you're talking about, changing we should do that. And at the same time, we have biology holding us back. Biology is holding us back, or is it a group mind holding us back? Don't know the difference. That is why I said to you earlier, mm -hmm. our amygdalas are different. And amygdala is a part of the brain. That idea of uh, uh, training your amygdala to uh, love police cars or hate police cars is a domain of development that's very hard for me to comment on. But isn't this now, okay, so now we're gonna move more into my domain for a minute. Isn't this more the function of transformation which is that when you sense there is something beyond, say, Phyllis, and something beyond Liv, and when you start to see that humanity is something that you are connected to, can you not understand and compartmentalize that, yes, you have had this history of suffering, and many dark people have this history of suffering, can you not expand yourself to include that and get beyond that and function in the world as an equal to the next person? The answer is yes, you can. And for some people, uh, depending upon where they grow up, um, that which you describe is still a luxury. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good point, because poor people, yeah. poor people, yeah. Yeah. poorly yeah. educated people. After I eat, feed my children, mm -hmm. uh, take care of uh, my front door, then I'll think about all that other stuff you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, so, then, so then how does the healing come about then? That is what I have been trying to think about. 
I've been thinking, thinking, thinking. And for some people, it's still a luxury. Not for the people who don't uh, respond to police cars that way. For them, it's not a luxury. For them, police cars are reassuring. Mm -hmm. For some of us, it is not. Well, they are me, not. Even me, it is not. You know, I, I can be honest about that. I mean, I, I have once had two flat tires, which is a very serious thing to have. And yeah. I waited until a policeman would come to my rescue. And instead of coming to my rescue, that policeman was running my place. And I kept saying, you know, I, I asked you here to help me. I need to know what to do in this circumstance. Because you can't get you can't get towed with one you know with both tires gone. You have to get a certain kind of tow truck. And so I, in that moment, that policeman was not looking to help me. That policeman wanted to make sure my car was not stolen. Correct. It was really, um, you know, it's. I'm not saying to dismiss that. Yeah. But you still have to work towards the healing because I think the injury to minorities is, will be severe if we don't work towards the healing. And I would also submit that the white poor counterparts in this story, even though they may have some privilege on some level, they too can be manipulated and injured as you can see in this current reality, that they are suffering as well. So for me, the healing is a very important goal and so I guess we have to keep looking at where can we, how can we heal this? Um, there are discussions uh, about the police department in Camden being transformed. There are good stories about good policemen and, uh, but you know, you can't, I guess, you know, I have to say with all of the black men and, and women who have been killed by police, uh, it's going to take a while to heal that. It's going to take some real time to heal that and maybe not heal it, maybe hold it as part of our painful history and then begin to heal the community. So, yeah. Yeah. What are you, where, where are you in your view on what's next for human beings? What do we ah. do? Yeah. Um, I've not gotten that far because I'm still living in what happens when human beings have been arbitrarily separated for a long time and the world changes. We, uh, I think the agreement now is that we are on pause in such a way that we have room to do things in a different way. So um, now that the pause is with us and we have a chance to do things differently, um, I'm uh, still wondering if we are able to be humans together. Because that is what we are um, thinking about. When I am thinking about uh, one of your other programs uh, that I saw with Label. Label was proposing that we see ourselves as part of a bigger um, world, that we're not separate. But when there is, for a long period of time, a legal uh, separation um, and punishment associated with um, breaking that legal, uh, that law, um, uh, our capacity to be with others may be impaired. So I'm mm -hmm. there. Uh, I'm there.